Okay, so now we're going to get into our third talk about homeostasis, and we're going to talk a little bit about circulation and respiration. So let's talk about circulation first. Um, we've studied some groups in lab that have had open circulatory systems. And so you've got a heart that pumps blood, but there aren't really a lot of blood vessels carrying the, the blood just kind of swishes around. And so most mollusks do this, um, the, but some of them have a more closed system that, that are more, you know, some of the mollusks that are more active have a closed system. Insects, most invertebrates, um, but then we also see closed circulatory systems and things like the, the uh, annelids, the segmented worms, vertebrates, you know, you have a closed circulatory system. And you can kind of see how these would form based upon the general uh, embryological development of different organisms, right? And so you remember those different germ layers that form when the animal is developing. And you can see how um, as the mesoderm forms, it forms this cavity called the salome, right? Or the salomic cavity. And so in the top example here, you can see how that salome is forming and the blastocele is disappearing. So remember when, when you have that ball of cells called a blastula, there's a hollow opening in there called the blastocele. And then as the mesoderm forms, that salome forms. And in this example, the blastocele disappears, but it doesn't really disappear. It actually forms the open space inside these major blood vessels. And so you can see how, look at how the salomic cavity is developing in this uh, annelid. This is an earthworm. And then the, as the mesoderm grows around, then it grows closed and, and connects around that blastocele, and that forms the dorsal blood vessel and the ventral blood vessel. And so that would be one way that you could form a closed circulatory system. But in other animals, the blastocele and the salome combine and fuse and, and to, uh, to form this opening called a hemocele. And so again, kind of look at the mesoderm and how the mesoderm forms in this bottom example, which is an arthropod. Um, and you can see that, that the two cavities sort of join together and you've got this just big open cavity and that's an open, one way to get an open circulatory system. So this hemocele is filled with something called hemolymph. And so it's blood and lymph combined, right? So you've got your lymphatic system and your circulatory system and the blood and lymph kind of stay apart, but here they're kind of combined. And so this hemolymph gets into the heart through little holes called ostia. And so since it's an open circulatory system, you don't really have all these vessels or a big vessel bringing blood to the heart you've just got a heart that's got lots of little holes in it and the hemolymph just kind of goes in through those holes and then the heart contracts and pumps the hemolymph toward the head and then it just sort of swishes around the body right it just sort of as the you know you, you keep pumping blood in there it's going to kind of push it and hemolymph it's going to kind of push it and it's going to move around the body but it's not really contained that's sort of how an open circulatory system is going to work and so they're showing you here um, in this diagram, you can see the little holes throughout the heart, the ostia, where the hemolymph goes in to the heart. And you see that there are some different structures that help sort of direct it as it, as it swishes around, but it doesn't swish at random. You've got these septa that help kind of guide the hemolymph. So it does sort of go in a particular order as it swishes around. But because it's an open system, you know, the hemolymph is not contained in vessels. You've got much lower blood pressure. And so you often see extra hearts that help to, you know, if you've got to move that hemolymph to extremities, like for example, here to the tips of the wings, there's not enough blood pressure to push that hemolymph all the way out there. And so sometimes you have secondary hearts that help to push this hemolymph where it needs to go. In a close circulatory system, of course, you've got vessels that carry the blood around. And so the blood gets pumped at the heart through arteries. And then you've got smaller 
arteries carrying blood away from the heart called arterioles which will then convert into capillaries which are the very fine net of blood vessels that are like one cell thick so they're very thin and delicate and this is where the blood can exchange things with the cells then those that blood gets carried to venules which turn into veins which are carrying blood back to the heart so you can direct blood more efficiently to regions where it's needed you know in the earlier example you sort of had these divisions which kind of forced the blood to go where you need it to go now you can pump it straight to where you need to go which so you can have larger animals more active animals because you're more efficiently getting blood where it's needed and because it's contained in these vessels you have higher blood pressure which again allows you to move that blood more quickly to where it's needed and so that's why you can have bigger organisms once you uh, have a closed circulatory system and so if you look at vertebrates you can see that um, different groups have more complicated hearts or at least hearts with more chambers in them so fish only have a two-chambered heart it's got a um, one um, ventricle one atrium now fish hearts do have these secondary chambers that sort of help uh, with heart function but really the heart itself only has those two chambers in reptiles and amphibians you've got a three-chambered heart so you've got two atria but one ventricle so you've just got one chamber that pumps and then of course in mammals like us we've got a four-chambered heart we've got two atria two ventricles so in the fish we say it's a single loop system blood goes from the heart to the gills to the body and back to the heart so it's just one big loop whereas in the organisms that have a three chambered or a four chambered heart you've got a double loop system you pump the blood from the heart to the lungs where you know you can do gas exchange pick up oxygen get rid of carbon dioxide then it comes back to the heart and then it gets pumped a second time to the body before returning to the heart so you've got two loops one that goes to the lungs and one that goes to the body whereas in the fish it's all one big loop you've got gills body all in the same loop this again allows you to maintain higher blood pressure to the body and so you can have larger uh, organisms so if you look at a three-chambered heart it's very similar to our four-chambered heart but you've only got the one ventricle and so you've got blood coming in so that ventricle is pumping blood both to the lungs and to the body well the blood that's going to the lungs does not have oxygen that's why you're sending it to the lungs the blood that's going to the body has oxygen it just came back from the lungs well, you don't want those two things to mix, right? It kind of defeats the purpose. And so how do you keep them apart? You've got this spiral fold that moves as the heart pumps and helps to keep the deoxygenated and the oxygenated blood from mixing. And so it works, but it's not as efficient as a four-chambered heart. And in a four-chambered heart, then, it has evolved to have separate chambers for the deoxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood. So now you don't have any mixing of the two and it's much more efficient. So the ventricles are completely separated. Instead of having this little spiral valve which kind of separates and kind of keeps the blood from mixing, now it's impossible for the blood to mix. Okay, so when any chamber contracts, it's called systole. And when any chamber relaxes, it's called diastole. And the atria and the ventricles are synchronized with each other, but opposite the other, right? So when the atria are in systole, the ventricles are in diastole. So when the atria contract, the ventricles are relaxed and vice versa. When the ventricles contract, the atria relax. And so if you look in this figure, this picture or this figure from your book, you can see that the atria are in systole they're contracting and the ventricles are relaxed and so the pressure is high in the atria and low in the ventricles and so that forces blood down into the ventricles then when the ventricles 
are in systole, when they contract, the atria are relaxed. And so the, the blood pressure is very high in the ventricles. Now, why then, you know, so when the atria contracted, that squeezed blood into the ventricles. Now the ventricles are contracting. Why doesn't blood get squeezed back into the atria? Well, notice those valves. You've got these one-way valves that close when the, you know, when the, the, when the atrium contracts, the valve gets pushed open. But when the ventricle contracts, that actually pushes the valve closed. It's like you got a little spring. They have these in plumbing, these one-way valves. And so the blood can't go back into the atrium, but it can go uh, to the rest of the body, either to the lungs or to the rest of the body. Um, but, you know, of course, sometimes these valves get leaky or if you've got a, you can have a condition where the valve isn't working very well. And so that's what happens is that when that ventricle contracts, some of the blood gets pushed back into the atrium. And so your heart's less efficient at pumping blood and that can be a problem. Now, how come, uh, first off, when we talk about blood pressure, there's always two numbers, right? Systolic and diastolic. And systolic is always the first number, the higher number, and diastolic is always the lower number. And so you're measuring the pressure of the ventricles contracting, right? So the blood pressure when the ventricles contract and then the blood pressure when the ventricles are relaxed. Well, how come diastolic pressure doesn't drop to zero? If the muscles aren't contracting, then how come there's pressure in the vessels and it's because uh, for a lot of reasons but the main reasons are the arteries and veins have elastic tissue and so it's like you know if, if you blow up a balloon and then you're not blowing into the balloon there's still pressure in the balloon because the the elastic tissue is holding that pressure but they also have this smooth muscle and so that smooth muscle that surrounds them that can contract and can increase the pressure and of course the smooth muscle in the capillaries helps to control where blood flow goes and so you know the muscles can contract and shut off flow to the capillaries or relax and allow flow to come in so those things help to maintain blood pressure also again those valves in the heart and you've also got those one-way valves in a lot of blood vessels and so when the ventricles contract and the pressure goes up and the blood shoots through the valve because the valve can open but then when the ventricles relax, those valves snap shut. And so the, instead of the blood flowing backwards, it can't go anywhere. And so it stays inside this, you know, this tube that's got the elastic tissue and it's got the, the um, uh, muscles. And so the blood pressure remains higher than zero, even though the heart is not contracting. Now remember, that the heart is made of cardiac muscle, a special kind of muscle. And so we talked about uh, skeletal muscle before, you know, that's very long, it's got many nuclei, the cardiac muscle uh, does not. There's uh, an anatomical differences here, which we're not going to get into, but, it, but realize it's a special kind of muscle. And the contraction of this muscle it, you know, it contracts in the same way as we described before. It's just a different kind of setup. But this, these muscle contractions are not controlled by nerve impulses, like in skeletal muscle. Um, instead, you've got what are known as pacemaker cells. And the pacemaker cell creates an electric impulse, which causes the cardiac muscle to contract. And so you create this electrical impulse which allows calcium to flow into the cells. And remember that calcium is the key to muscle contraction. And so um, this electrical impulse opens voltage sensitive protein gates, which allows calcium to flow and that starts the contraction. So the contraction is the same, but it's not controlled by a nerve. It's controlled by these special cells in the heart. Um, so the primary pacemaker cells are at the uh, sinoatrial node. So you see where this is. It's right there um, at the first atrium where the blood is coming into the heart from the rest of the body. And so an electrical signal starts there and causes the atria 
to contract. And again, why? Because the electrical signal opens voltage sensitive gates, which allows calcium to flow into those muscle cells of those atria, and that starts a contraction. Remember how when calcium flows in, it binds to tropomyosin, causes the tropomyosin to move and expose an active site on an actin fiber. And once that active site or that binding site is exposed, myosin can bind to the actin and then the myosin flexes and it pulls against the actin. So again, the presence of calcium is what triggers this off. And this pacemaker cell, by using an electric signal, causes calcium to flow in. Now, when that electric signal reaches the secondary pacemaker, this is at the, uh, what is called the atrioventricular node, that's deeper in the heart. And so when that electric signal reaches that second pacemaker, it causes that second pacemaker to fire an electric signal. And so then that signal is gonna cause the ventricles to contract. And you can see, if you follow the secondary pacemaker, you see how it's, it's uh, fibers of these cells spread down and surround these big ventricle muscles, right? The ventricles are a lot bigger, but you've got this way to rapidly propagate that signal to both of them so that they will also contract, uh, you know, at the same time. But because these pacemakers are separated spatially a little bit, it takes a second for that signal from the primary pacemaker to make it and cause the secondary pacemaker to fire. So this is how you can coordinate the contraction of the atria and then follow that with the contraction of the ventricles. And so what I'm showing you here is again how these cells can rapidly propagate that signal so that you, you know, all that cardiac muscle in the ventricles can contract at the same time. And so in this way you have the ventricles firing, you know, a second after the atria fire. And so you can have the ventricles contracting now the while the atria are relaxed and you can coordinate the contraction and relaxation of the atria with the ventricles. So this primary pacemaker is controlled by nerves from the cardiac center in the brain. So the muscle contractions themselves are not controlled by nerves. They're controlled by these pacemaker cells. But the pacemaker cells are controlled by nerves, right? And so, you know, your heart rate can go up and can go down. And it's your brain that's controlling that by controlling these pacemaker cells. And so if something happens and you start exercising or you get scared or something, then nerve signals from your brain go to this pacemaker cell and cause that. So, you know, the direct contraction is not directly controlled by nerves from your brain, but it's secondarily controlled. Um, now, the types of nerves that slow down the heart are called parasymp parasympathetic nerves, whereas ones that cause the heart rate to go up are called sympathetic nerves. So you've got this whole parasympathetic nervous system and a sympathetic nervous system that, you know, one speeds things up and one slows things down. And again, this is homeostasis. Those two things work together to kind of control your body. The way you want to remember this is the sympathetic nervous system kicks in when the animal needs sympathy. And so when does the animal need sympathy? When they're being threatened, you know, when they're being chased by a predator or when they're being attacked by a rival or something like that. Again, we're talking about fight or flight. Whenever an organism is um, something scary happens to the organism, it's either going to fight this new thing or it's gonna run the heck away. In either case, that organism needs sympathy because something bad is happening. And so that's when the sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in. And things like your heart rate's going to go up, your respiration rate's going to go up, your blood vessels are going to dilate, all those things you need in your fight or flight response. But you can't keep that up forever. At some point, you need to calm back down. And that's what the parasympathetic nervous system does. It slows that heartbeat down. And so this then is why 
if you have if you have trouble with your heart and the beating is not well coordinated you can insert a pacemaker because all you need is an electrical impulse at the atria a split second before the ventricles and you need that to be coordinated in a very regular fashion and so what an artificial pacemaker is is just a little machine with a battery that can do that right it's just a timer and so it can send an electrical signal to the atria and then to the ventricles and to the atria and to the ventricles and you can see how it's embedded in the chest and the wires are run through the heart with little simple electrodes that can help control the pace of that beating but um you know it's it's it doesn't control it exclusively you know your heart rate can still speed up and slow down as is determined by your brain this just helps to coordinate it a little bit better but anyway that's why pacemakers work so that's kind of cool okay so that's just a brief introduction into circulation um just talking about some cool things uh, in our next section, we're going to talk a little bit more, but this time, in the next section, we're going to talk about respiration. So um, until then, I'll see you later.